Chapter 37 of the book of Jeremiah. Thank you for joining me. It's always a pleasure on this rainy, stormy day. Very rare in Amarillo. And King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. Notes. Now I find this kind of interesting right here. You see, Zedekiah was Josiah's son, but not in the kingly line. For instance, Nathan was David's son, but not as Solomon in the kingly line. Now, Coniah was Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim. In fact, Je uh, Jehoiakim was the last son of David to reign on the throne of Judah. You can find that back in chapter 22, verse 30. Thus, the Davidic line of kings came to an end in him. The next king to reign upon that throne will be the Messiah, the eternal king of David's seed, and this he will do at the second advent. We are coming near those times right now. Verse 2, But neither he who is Zedekiah, nor his servants, nor the people of the land did hearken unto the words of the Lord, which he spoke by the prophet Jeremiah. Notes. Now Zedekiah and his cabinet ministers, like many today, were willing uh, that God's servants should pray for them, like in verse 3, we're fixing to cover it, but determined to continue to disobey the word. The Holy Spirit is emphatic that basically the entirety of the land of Judah would not heed Jeremiah. Verse 3. And Zedekiah the king sent Jehuchal the son of Shelemiah, and Zephaniah the son of Maasai the priest, to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Pray now unto the Lord our God for us. Notes. Now, quite possibly Zedekiah, in sending this embassy to Jeremiah, was doing so as Hezekiah had sent such to Isaiah many years earlier in view of Mr. Sennacherib's invasion. You see, the king expected Jeremiah to pray for the city to be spared as Isaiah had done way back in Isaiah chapter 37 verse 6. However, it was the will of God for Jerusalem to be spared during the time of Hezekiah, but not his will for the land or the city to be spared at this time. Uh, God had decided he was going to bring the judgment down. Verse 4. Now Jeremiah came in and went out among the people, for they had not put him into prison. Notes. You see, even though he was not in prison now, the situation would soon change because he would be incarcerated. His prison experiences are as followed. Number one, he was put in prison for the first time on false charges, found in 37, 11 through 15. Yeah, number two, he was released but confined to the court of the prison, found in chapter 37, verses uh, 21. And you have to remember chronologically, chapter 37 precedes chapter 32, where Jeremiah was in prison, which was at the close of Zedekiah's reign. Number three, he was imprisoned again in a miry dungeon. We're going to find that out in chapter 38, verse 1 through 6. Uh, basically, a... Uh, uh, a, a dungeon that was basically doubled over as a sewer line of sorts. Number four, he was released again as before, found in chapter 38, verse 13 through 28. He was carried away in chains by Nebuchadnezzar, found in chapter 40, verse 1, but Nebuchadnezzar was strangely nice to him. Now, verse uh, number six, he was released from chains in Ramah, found in chapter 40, verses 1 through 4. He, uh, I, if I memory serves me correctly, he even got sent to college, as strange as that might actually sound. I have to relearn my lesson there, I guess. We'll cover it, though. Verse 5. Then Pharaoh's army was come forth out of Egypt, and when the Chaldeans that besieged Jerusalem heard tidings of them, they departed from Jerusalem. Notes. Now, at this time, seeing the armies fleeing, no doubt... Jeremiah was ridiculed very greatly by the people because it seemed like the predictions of the false prophets concerning the salvation of Jerusalem were going to be correct after all. You see, Jeremiah had constantly prophesied that no help would be forthcoming from Egypt and that Judah and Jerusalem would not be spared. 
Well, for a very short period of time, it looked like he was wrong. Verse 6. Then came the word of the Lord unto the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Thus shall you say to the king of Judah, who sent you unto me to inquire of me, Behold, Pharaoh's army, which is come forth to help you, shall return to Egypt into their own land. Notes. Now, court preachers are careful to say what kings wish to hear. However, it was not so with Jeremiah. And you have to keep in mind, these false prophets did indeed look like what they had said was going to happen, because Pharaoh seemed to have just uh, been willing to do what the Jewish people wanted at that time. But he backed out at the last second. Verse 8. And the Chaldeans shall come again and fight against this city and take it and burn it with fire. Notes. Jehoiakim had taken the leaves of the Bible and thrown them into the fire. Now the Chaldeans shall take Jerusalem and burn it with fire. What we sow, we reap. Verse 9. Thus saith the Lord, Deceive not yourselves, saying, The Chaldeans shall surely depart from us, for they shall not uh, depart. Notes. Now, Inasmuch as the army of Nebuchadnezzar did indeed withdraw to fight the Egyptians, the false prophets, and hence the people, were having a field day exclaiming the veracity of their false prophecies while denouncing Jeremiah. They were doing exactly as the Holy Spirit warned them about. They were deceiving themselves. You know, Nebuchadnezzar rolled up his sleeves and took care of the Egyptians, and now he's coming after the Jews now is what happened. Verse 10. For though you had smitten the whole army of the Chaldeans who fight against you, and there remained but wounded men among them, yet should they rise up every man in his tent and burn this city with fire. Notes. The, well, the idea is very simple. Nothing can stop the prophecies of Jeremiah from being fulfilled. He's basically saying, hey, if the Egyptians really, really beat up the Babylonians really, really bad, still the Babylonians were going to invade Jerusalem and take it over. Verse 11. And it came to pass that when the army of the Chaldeans was broken up from Jerusalem for fear of Pharaoh's army, then Jeremiah went forth out of Jerusalem to go to the land of Benjamin to separate himself thence in the midst of the people. Notes. Now, the Pharaoh referred to was named Horpha. Or, uh, wait a minute, I think his name is actually Hophra, if I'm uh, pronouncing uh, it correct. The RPs of Herodotus, and uh, he had another couple of strange names Ua Abra of the Monuments. As strange as that actually sounds. The retreat of the Chaldean army would prove to be short-lived with the Egyptian army being quickly defeated and the siege of Jerusalem uh, beginning once again. And when the Chaldean army began to retreat in the face of coming Egyptians, the situation for Jeremiah must have became rather hot. No doubt they were threatening to stone him or hang him right there on the spot. And so he just decided to get out of Dodge before something uh, really happened to him, I guess, even though uh, he was promised nothing really bad would happen to him. Verse 13, And when he was at the gate of Benjamin, a captain of the ward was there, whose name was Arijah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Hananiah, and he took Jeremiah the prophet, saying, You fall away to the Chaldeans. Notes. Arijah was the grandson of Hananiah, who was probably the same Hananiah of chapter 28. If so, this would explain Arijah's action. He would now falsely accuse the prophet, claiming his defection to the Chaldeans. You know, oh, we can't beat him, so we're going to join him, or something to that effect. Verse 14. Then Jeremiah said, It is false, I fall not away to the Chaldeans, but he hearkened not to him. So Arijah took Jeremiah and brought him to the princes. Notes. Long story short, Jeremiah got cuffed and stuffed. Such great treatment for a man of God. Verse 15. 
Wherefore the princes were wroth with Jeremiah, and smote him, and put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe. For they made that the prison. Note. In other words, they're accusing him of being a traitor. They're accusing him of causing some kind of problem with the throne. They're accusing him of this and that. Uh, they're trumping up charges against him. And he probably had an alibi as long as a roll of toilet paper with false charges. Verse 16. When Jeremiah was entered into the dungeon and into the cabins, and Jeremiah had remained there many days. Notes. Now the word dungeon refers to an underground excavation with the word cabins possibly referring to particular vaults or cells in this place. Uh, little cubby holes, if you will, with Jeremiah put in one of them. He probably remained there for several weeks or even several months. Verse 17. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took him out, and the king asked him secretly in his house, and said, Is there any word from the Lord? And Jeremiah said, There is. For said he, You shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. Notes. Now, I find this very interesting and rather sad at the same time. You see, the question asked by Zedekiah, is there any word from the Lord? And this shows that this man knew in his heart that Jeremiah, there was something kind of special about him, that maybe he was actually a true prophet of God. But yet he was not strong enough to stand up and do that which was right. The answer to his question was not to the king's liking, so... We got to let our ego get in the way. Verse 18. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto the king Zedekiah, What have I offended against you, or against your servants, or against the people that you have put me in prison? Where are now your prophets which prophesied unto you, saying, The king of Babylon shall not come up against you, nor against his land? Notes. I see, Jeremiah's got his finger right on the button with this guy. These false prophets went on and on and on, very boldly proclaiming upon the coming of the Egyptian army, which resulted in the retreat of the Babylonian army. Jeremiah's name then became a joke, but now the table turned. The Egyptians are totally defeated, with the Babylonians once again laying siege to the city. The prophets, the false ones, are no longer to be heard. The fallacy of their prophecies has completely silenced them. So they know for an absolute fact that they were full of it right there from the start, and Jeremiah is pleading his case. Hey, dummy. I'm the only one telling you any truth here. Now let's see what happens. Verse 20. Therefore, hear now, I pray you, O my lord the king, let my supplication, I pray you, be accepted before you, that you cause me not to return to the house of Jonathan the scribe, lest I die there. Notes. Uh, Jeremiah's pathetic appeal not to be left to die of starvation in the dungeon while showing his natural fear of death makes his courage and testimony a little bit more remarkable, and the result proves that honest reproof sometimes gain more favor than flattery. Jeremiah was a faithful preacher of the divine message, even though he shows some failures and, you know, some doubts here and there. He most earnestly and affectionately warned the king of the sure wrath of God and begged him to accept the grace of God that promised absolute safety. Absolute safety from the wrath that was to come. But the king, like most today in the modern world, they choose death rather than life. Verse 21, Then Zedekiah the king commanded that they should commit Jeremiah into the court of the prison, like I said in my notes, and that they should give him daily a piece of bread out of the baker's street until all the bread in the city were spent. Thus Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Notes, Now the city is under siege by the Babylonians once again, and it quickly runs out of food. And hence, if Zedekiah had not commanded that Jeremiah be allowed to remain in the court of the prison, and that they should give him daily a piece of bread, he would have starved to death. 
So, I mean, Jeremiah was at least trying to use his head as far as that was concerned, even though God had promised him that, you know, nothing really, really majorly bad was going to happen to you. I mean, he got roughed up a little bit right there, but be that as it may. Chapter 38. And this really just gets disgusting right here. Then Shephatiah the son of Matan, and Gedaliah the son of Pasher, and Jucal the son of Shelemiah, and Pasher the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he who goes forth to the Chaldean shall live, for he shall have his life for a prey, and shall live. Notes. Now, the individuals mentioned in this verse were the high ups in the government circles. Uh, setting themselves against the will of God, they demanded the life of Jeremiah. They'd go to any length they could to shut this man up, even though all he was doing was trying to save their hides. There was absolutely no doubt as to what the message said or its intent. Therefore, the leaders of Judah as well as the people were simply without excuse. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar was practically knocking on their door threatening to destroy them right then and right there. But they refused to listen. If I told you that a tornado was going to appear right there in your city and you knew for a fact that it was going to happen, wouldn't you get out of the way? Verse 3. Thus saith the Lord, the city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which shall take it. Therefore the princes said unto the king, We beseech you, let this man be put to death. For thus he weakens the hands of the men of war who remain in this city, and the hands of all the people, in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeks not the welfare of this people, but the harm. Notes. Now i got to say this about Jeremiah. It really kind of impresses me. Even in the face of what looked like certain death, Jeremiah did not back down. Verse 5. Then Zedekiah said, Then Zedekiah the king said, Behold, he is in your hand, for the king is not he who can do anything against you. Notes. Now, as you can see, it's pretty obvious by now that Zedekiah was a pathetic excuse of any kind of ruler. He didn't have very much of a backbone, it seemed. He didn't send stand up for anything that was right like the old country song says you gotta stand for something or you're gonna fall for anything you gotta be your own man not a puppet on a string well unfortunately Zedekiah had all of those negative qualities verse 6 then they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Malachiah or Malchiah I should say the son of Hamalek that was in the court of the prison and they let down Jeremiah with cords, and in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sunk in the mire. Notes. Now Jeremiah sank in the mire physically, but Zedekiah sank into it morally. The mire to the one was a mantle of glory, but to the other it was a vesture of shame. Jeremiah was left in this terrible predicament to die of hunger, surrounded in uh, filth. Well, such was the cruelty of the haters of truth. A servants of God must not think it a strange thing if God permits such suffering to befall them. I mean, they basically lowered him down into a sewer. Can you imagine how it stunk? Verse 7. Now when Ebed-Melech, the Ethiopian, one of the eunuchs, was in the king's house, he heard that they had put Jeremiah in the dungeon, the king then sitting in the gate of Benjamin. Notes. Now, Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, was the king's slave, and no doubt he was African American. He was actually used greatly of God in saving Jeremiah's life, and no doubt was a convert to Israel's God. For doing this thing, his life would be spared at the sack of Jerusalem. Chapter 39, verse 15 through 18 documents that. Okay. Verse 8. Ebed-Melech went forth out of the king's house and spoke to the king, saying... Notes. Now you have to remember, uh, to do this to a king, to be a mere servant of the king, was definitely a very brave thing to do. 
to do this, he was taking his life into his own hands. So, I mean, you can see a lot of bravery in this African-American fellow. I mean, he's basically standing up for what people thought was the enemy of all enemies to them. Verse 9. My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they have done to Jeremiah the prophet, whom they cast into the dungeon, and he is like to die of hunger in the place where he is, for there is no more bread in the city. Notes. This African-American fellow showed no fear regarding these princes who had determined to kill Jeremiah at all costs. He called it right down the middle. He said that this was a wicked thing. In effect, he is telling the king that not only are those other people full of garbage, but you're full of garbage as well. What an act of bravery by someone that was so downtrodden. You know, the God of the Bible does not approve of slavery in this particular sense in which I actually believe it was. Whenever we think of the word slave, we indeed think of an African American getting beaten senseless if he doesn't pick a certain amount of cotton. But uh, there were many degrees of slavery as far as the word of God was concerned. I mean, it could have meant the servant, a servant of any kind. As a matter of fact, I could actually be considered a slave to my boss, for instance. Uh, verse 10. You can look up the word slave and it is indeed a very, wor uh, very loose term. But anyways, verse 10. Then the king commanded Ebed-Melech the Ethiopian, saying, Take from hence... 30 men with you and take up Jeremiah the prophet out of the dungeon before he dies. Notes. Now the courage of this Ethiopian man stands here in contrast with the cowardice of the king. He boldly and publicly braved the anger of both the princes and the people and so shamed the king that he obtained authority to deliver the prophet. So dangerous was this mission that he needed 30 soldiers as a protecting guard. So, I mean, you can see the situation was definitely a very scary situation. Verse 11. So Ebed-Melech took the men with him and went into the house of the king under the treasury and took thence old cast clouts and the old rotten rags and let them down by cords into the dungeon to Jeremiah. Notes. This dungeon was a place where water was normally kept, but from which the water had recently been used, leaving nothing but sediment, muck, and mire, and, like I said, was probably used for a sewer line of some kind, which was probably several feet thick. In this muck, Jeremiah had sunk. But keep in mind, he hadn't morally sunk. The king did. Verse 12. And Abed-Melech, the Ethiopian, said unto Jeremiah, Put now these old cast clouts and rotten rags under your armholes under the cords. And Jeremiah did so. Notes. Now, for the life of me, I just got to say this. I cannot understand where in the world the uh, translators get the word armholes. I've never seen that before. I don't even know what that actually means. But it probably means that they hooked him under his shoulders and kind of keel hauled him upwards. You know, much like a, uh, like you would imagine a prisoner tying his bed sheets together to climb down. Well, they basically threw all these rotten rags down and pulled him up that way. What a prize they grabbed. Verse 13. So they drew up Jeremiah with cords and took him out of the dungeon, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Notes. Well, i got to say this also. The court of a prison certainly was not paradise, but it was a whole lot better than being down there in the sewer. They treated him like a ninja turtle. Verse 14. Then Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah the prophet unto him into the third entry that is in the house of the Lord. And the king said unto Jeremiah, I will ask you this thing. Hide nothing from me. Notes. Zedekiah knew that Jeremiah was God's prophet and that the words he spoke were indeed from God. But yet he would not heed them for he loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Just like in John chapter 12, verse 43. Oh boy. So indicative of a Pharisee. They want the praise of men. 
verse 15. Then Jeremiah said unto Zedekiah, If I declare it unto you, will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you counsel, will you not hearken unto me? Notes. You see the nobility and elevation of Jeremiah's character appear in this, that in his little interview with the king he did not indignantly denounce the brutality of his enemies and demanded their just punishment. Neither did he in true righteous anger rebuke the king for his cowardly conduct in the matter. On the contrary, he earnestly and affectionately begged the king to save his life and theirs by obeying the word of God and surrendering to the Chaldeans. I mean, how, how many times do you have to have a chance in order to get something right? Verse 16. So Zedekiah the king swore secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord lives, who made us this soul, I will not put you to death, neither will I give you into the hand of these men who seek your life. Notes. Now we see a little bit of a backbone here. Who made us this soul means may God take my life if I take yours. Verse 17. Then said Jeremiah unto Zedekiah, Thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, I, If you will surely go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then your soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you shall live in your house. But if you will not go forth to the king of Babylon's princes, then shall this city be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape out of their hand. Notes once again, the choice is very crystal clear. You do the right thing and you do it God's way or you are going to have a living hell explode onto your case. Verse 19. And Zedekiah the king said unto Jeremiah, I am afraid of the Jews who are fallen to the Chaldeans lest they deliver me into their hand and they mock me. Notes. Well, Zedekiah does actually have some sense here, but like millions of other people, they feared men more than they fear God. As a result, he had neither the help of man or God. Verse 20. But Jeremiah said, They shall not deliver you. Obey, I beseech you, the voice of the Lord which I speak unto you, so it shall be well unto you, and you shall live. Verse 21, But if you refuse to go forth, this is the word the Lord has shown me. Notes. You have to learn from this that you are basically the captain of your soul. Every choice that you make has a consequences. And the words are right here, but if you refuse to go forth, proclaim man's free moral agency. The Lord will, pro he will proclaim the right way to the individual, but will never force a person's will. The very nature of obedience demands free moral agency, or else it is not obedience, but rather slavery, and God's not going to have you as a slave. You're going to either choose Him, or you're going to choose something else. However, to disobey God sets oneself against God's perfect order of creation and the restoration of all things, and catastrophe is always going to be the end result, as we will find out. Verse 22. And behold, all the women who are left in the king of Judah's house shall be brought forth to the king of Babylon's princes, and those women shall say, Your friends have set you on and have prevailed against you. Your feet are sunk in the mire, and they are turned away back. Notes That which God was attempting to impress upon Zedekiah and upon all the princes, or I, I should say, and upon all for the principal holds, is that the very thing we fear and which causes us not to obey God will in our disobedience bring the thing feared upon us and even in a far greater measure. So it's just better to listen to Him. Chapter 38 verse 23 is where we're going to have to pick up. Thank you and God bless. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.